Hey everyone, welcome back to 348. So today we're going to start off a, uh, a discussion of functions again. Uh, we're going to learn a lot about functions, period of which for the rest of the quarter. Everything after this midterm that we are, everything after the midterm is all about using functions in super cool ways. So let's get right into it without any further delay. So what I have right here is some review information about functions. We say that f is a function from a to b. It maps elements from our set a to set b, where uh, a and b are non-empty sets. Uh, every element of a is mapped to exactly one element in b. So if this is uh, something that you don't remember, maybe go back to the intro to functions video because this is a really important fact right here, is that a function maps every element in a to exactly one element in b, that you don't have uh, some, you don't have uh, an element in our domain mapped to two or three or four elements of the codomain. You don't have it mapped to zero elements in the codomain. Every element in our domain, uh, which in this case is A, is mapped to exactly one element in the codomain. However, elements in our codomain, elements in B, can be mapped to any number of times. So it's possible for an element in the codomain to be mapped to zero times, one time, two times, etc., etc. We have our domain here, we have our uh, range, sorry, we have our domain, we have our codomain, and we have a definition for the range of f, which is equal to all b, oh, sorry, all elements b in the codomain, such that there exists an a in the domain, such that f of a equals b. And we say that range f, the range of f is a subset of our codomain b, because it contains at most as many elements in our codomain, since F maps elements to our codomain. Furthermore, when we have something like f of x equals y, say that x is a pre-image of y. X is a pre-image of y, I should, be, I should specify here. And we say that y is the image of x because a, uh, an element in our, in our domain can have only one image since it's mapped to only one element in the codomain. So that's a very brief review of everything that we covered in the Intro to Functions video. If you're having trouble with this stuff, I highly recommend brushing up on this by going back and watching the video. Uh, the, the information in that video will be really important to keep in mind as we keep on going through all this discussion about functions. So if you're not, if you're not uh, comfortable, and uh, if you're not like completely comfortable with functions whatsoever, now is a great time to stop. Take a look at the Intro to Functions video. Ask me questions if you have any. And we, we really just want to get everything, you know, get you caught up to speed so that I can, so this, so that we can really uh, proceed along in this video uh, without too much trouble. So this video is, all, is going to be all about uh, stronger types of functions. So the definition of function is already pretty strong, saying that, you know, every element in our domain can be mapped to exactly one element in the codomain. But we're, we can even get any that we can get f even stronger. So what we're going to do is we're going to let f be some function from a to b. We say that f is called one to one, uh, and we can abbreviate using the number one dash one like so. If for any two uh, values x y in a, and for z in b, f of x equals equaling z and f of y equaling z implies that x equals y. So it's a pretty complicated definition. So what this means, I tried to break it down a little bit. What it means is that at most one A in our domain can map to any element in the codomain. Or we could say that for every element in the codomain, if that element has a preimage, then that preimage is unique. So what really what this means is that every element in the domain, or sorry, in the codomain, is mapped to by f from 0 or 1 elements in A. So what we can do is we can actually take a look at, at uh, a couple examples of one-to-one -one functions. So what I have are, I have two example functions mapping from the same uh, domains to the same codomains. And right here, this one basically takes uh, 
A and brings it to 7. This one takes B and also brings it to 7. So we would say that this F, uh, let's call this F sub 1, is not 1 to 1. And the reason why is because 7 is mapped to by multiple elements in our domain, by A and B. So because we have F of A equals 7, F of B equals 7, and A not equal to B, because we have all three of these right here, we can say that F sub 1 is not 1 to 1. However, right here, what we have, let's call this one F sub 2, is we have A being mapped to 7, and B being mapped to 1, and nothing maps to 4. So because 1 is only mapped to by B, because 7 is only mapped to by A, and because 4 is not mapped to at all, this actually qualifies as 1 to 1. So F2 is 1 to 1, like so. So for a function to be 1 to 1, every element in the codomain has to either have at most one preimage, or sorry, has to have at most one preimage. So that either means exactly one preimage or exactly zero preimages, like so. Now let's take a look at one more right here. Let's say this is A, B, and C. Uh, we're going to call this one F3. And let's say this has elements uh, 1 and 2, like so. Let's say this is uh, the sets C and D. Now if we're trying to build a function from these, let's say we're trying to build an, a 1 to 1 function from C to D. So we'll note that every element here has to have a mapping under F3. We have to start at we have to start exactly one arrow from each of these points on C. And the problem is is that we have three arrows, but we only have two places to bring them to. So while for a normal function that's fine, we can't make a one to one function. So no matter what we do, let's arbitrarily choose this. Let's say a equals two. Now, if we're trying to build a one-to-one -one function, we would have, we would, and we're going from B, well, the only choice we have for B is to go to one like this, and then C can't go anywhere new, so we have to bring C to a place that's, that has already been touched, so like so. So now what we have is we have F of A equals two, F of C equals two, and A is not equal to C. So by all three of these facts, and I'll remind you again, the uh, definition of 101 says that if f of x and f of y equal the same thing, then x have to equal x has to equal y in order for f to be 1 to 1. So because we have that f of a equals 2 and f of c equals 2, but a is not equal to c, uh, and this should be f3, uh, f3 is not 1 to 1. So... What I want to generalize this to is that if a function is one to one, then the uh, domain has to be less than or equal to the size of the codomain. And similarly, if we have a domain that is greater than the size of the codomain, then we cannot make a one to one function in between them. Otherwise, we sort of uh, see what we have here, which is that we run out of unique outputs for every single input. So. That's the definition of one to one. That's one of the stronger uh, function types that we'll be talking about. And we'll move on to another one in just a moment. Actually, that uh, last transition is not uh, is not very appropriate because we're actually still working with one-to-one -one functions. So right here, what I have is actually I have a theorem given a specific function. How do I show that a function is one-to-one? -one? And this one actually, you know, the, the, in this case, it's f of x equals e to the x. And what we're trying to do basically is show that e to the x satisfies this property right here. Well, we'll take some arbitrary x and y, and we'll say that suppose f of x equals f of y, and then show why x must equal y. So what we can do is we'll, we'll just start doing that. So as a proof, we'll start a proof by saying, let x and y be real numbers such that f of x equals f of y. Well, if f of x equals f of y, then we can immediately apply our definition of f right here to say that, okay, well, that means e to the x equals e to the y. And we can take the natural log of both sides because this is uh, this is basically algebra. So the natural log of e to the x equals 
natural log of e to the y. Applying our rules of natural logs, uh, powers come up first. So x natural log e equals y natural log e. Natural log of e goes to 1, so then we have x equals y. So because of this, because we chose arbitrary values for x and y such that this condition was fulfilled, and then we show that x equals y always, what this shows is that, therefore, uh, f is 1 to 1. And we can end our proof like that. So this is what basically what we do when we try to show that a function is one-to-one, -one, is we take two elements from the domain and we suppose that f of x or f of f applied to those two elements from the domain equal each other. Then we show that those two elements are must actually be the same element in some way. Here's another example. We can do um, theorem. We can say f from the real numbers to the real numbers defined by f of x equals x cubed plus 1 is 1 to 1. We did the exact same thing here. So we'll let x and y be real numbers such that f of x equals f of y. And this means that x cubed plus 1 equals y cubed plus 1. And then we're just doing algebra here, x cubed equals y cubed, and then x equals y. So then, therefore, f is 1 to 1. So whenever, whenever you see a proof that says, prove that this function is 1 to 1, this is what you want to do. You want to start out by making your assumption let x and y be in our domain such that f of x equals f of y. And then you show y that must mean that x equals y. You should always be doing this when you see a, uh, pr when you see a proof that a function is one to one. You always start out with having two elements in the domain such that f applied to those two elements equal each other. And then you show that those two elements must also equal each other. I cannot stress that enough. Um, Please remember to do this on your homework. It will make lives, your life a lot easier. So now let's take a look at how we can show when a function is not one-to-one. -one. So our next theorem is that f applied to, let's say, the integers to the integers defined by f of x equals x squared is not one-to-one. -one. And what does it mean for a function to not be one-to-one? -one? Well, what we have here is we're saying that f of x equals z and f of y equals z implies x equals y. So we have f of x equals z and f of y equals z implies uh, oops, x equals y. So if we're trying to take the negation of this, You'll, you might, you'll hopefully remember from our whole proof by contraposition, uh, contradiction video what the negation of this is. It will end up being equivalent to f of x equals z and f of y equals z and x is not equal to y. In fact, we actually saw this in our examples over here of functions that are not one-to-one. -one. So in this case, we have that f1 is not one-to-one -one because f of a and f of b both equal 7, but a is not equal to b. And same thing down here, we have that f of a and f of c both equal 2, but a is not equal to c, so f is not 1 to 1. And that's exactly what we can do here, is we need to find two elements of our domain that are not equal to each other, but where their output through the function both are the same. So what we can do for this one is we can say, now this is, okay, this is actually a, uh, a proof where we take an example. We're, we're basically finding an example of two numbers that uh, act as a counterexample for our definition of one-to-one. -one. So you can notice right here, uh, when, we're, when we're showing, um, when we're talking about the definition of one-to-one -one right here, we're basically saying for all x and y and a and z and b, 
So what we need to do instead is if we're trying to show the negation of this, we're going to apply De Morgan's laws for predicates and then say, okay, well, there exists an X and Y and A and a Z and B such that this whole thing is false. So all we need to do is we need to show one counterexample. So you can say, consider uh, one and negative one, which are both in the integers. Note that one is not equal to negative one. Uh, and I'm, this seems very obvious, and it really is, but I'm, I'm just trying to satisfy, I'm trying to point out where we satisfy the definition and where we contradict the definition. So this part right here is going to show the contradictory part of the definition. Note that one is not equal to negative one, but that f of one equals one squared equals one, which equals negative one squared, which equals f of negative one. So we have here that f of one equals f of negative one, but one is not equal to negative one. Thus, f is not one to one. And this, I guess I should say right here, right here, and right here, you would want to cite the definition of one to one. So we would say, therefore, f is one to one by definition. Uh, by definition down here as well. And by definition as well. So by definition. There we go. Another thing you could do right here is we could do a proof by contradiction. So we would say proof, uh, suppose otherwise for a contradiction. But really all we would have to do here is then point out that we have one and negative one in the integers that such that, you know, they're not equal but f of one equals f of negative one. So really, we could do a direct proof for this, we could do a proof by contradiction of this, and they would honestly turn out pretty similar. So whichever way works better for you and your brain, uh, either of those ways is totally fine. So that's one-to-one -one functions. All right, so our next definition is for an onto function. So we say if f is a function from a to b, f is called onto if for all elements in our codomain, there exists some element in the domain such that f of applied to that element in the domain equals the element in the codomain. What this means is that we say that every element in our codomain has at least one pre-image. So every element in the codomain is mapped to by at least one element in the domain. What this also means is that the range of f the, the set of all elements in our codomain that can actually be accessed by our function is actually exactly equal to the codomain because what we're saying is that every element in the codomain can be accessed by one element, at, at least one element in the domain. So as an example, we can take, uh, let's say, A, B, C, D, and E. Let's say we have our function f1 right here, and let's map them to uh, to 1, 4, and 7. Why not? So I'm just going to pick some arbitrary mappings like so. So let's say a goes to 7, b goes to 4, c goes to 1, d goes also to 1, and e goes uh, e also goes to 7, like so. So what we have is that every element in our codomain has some has at least one of these arrows going to it. It's mapped to from at least one element in here in our domain. If this is a and b, so we'd say that f1 is on two. However, if we did something similar, uh, let's say we have um, you know a, b, c, d, and e again, same sets as before. Uh, let's say 1, 4, and 7. Let's say we have F2, where F2 just maps everything to 4. Just 
this massive cluster of arrows all pointing at four. So because one doesn't have anything mapping to it, F2 is not on two. And similarly, seven doesn't have map anything mapping onto it. But we really only need one example of an element in here that is not mapped to by our function to show that F2 is not on two because no x in our domain exists such that f2 of x equals 1, for example. We can also say that no x in a exists such that f2 in x equals 7. So this is what I mean by on2, is that uh, basically everything in here, everything in our codomain, has to have something mapping to it. And if that's the case, then that function is on to. Let's take a look at one, at one more. So, you know, this is our A and B. Let's make uh, sets C and D. Let's say this is A and this is B. Uh, let's say this is F3. Let's say we have uh, 3, 7, and negative 4, like so. So, Given that this is a function, we can only map uh, every element in A to exactly one element. Sorry, uh, let's actually need the C and uh, D right here. So we can only map every element in C to exactly one element in D. So we can map A to 3 like this, and maybe let's say B to negative 4. And what we have is we've run out of ways to map things to elements, which means that 7 cannot get a mapping whatsoever. So F3 is not on to no x in a uh, sorry x and c is such that f of x equals seven. So here's the thing is that the cardinality of c is less than the cardinality of d and because of that since you can only map every element of c to exactly one element in d just by the definition of a function this prevents D from being equal to, or from, sorry, from being on two whatsoever. So in order for a function to be on two, its codomain has to be smaller than or equal to its domain. And if the codomain is larger than the domain, then the function cannot be on two. Now, a funny thing is, is you can notice that this is actually a one-to-one -one function because all of these, uh, all of these, sorry, all of the elements in the codomain have at most one mapping to them. So this is a one-to-one -one function, but it is not on two. This is an on two function. Oh, this is an on two function, but because we have multiple things going to seven and one, it is not one-to-one. -one. So I, I, what I'd like to think, well, yeah, we'll talk about that later. But right now what we can do is we can prove a couple of theorems of showing how we know certain things are onto and how we know certain things are not onto. So let's take a look first at a function that we covered last time. Let's say um, uh, let's say f of let me start this over. f from the real numbers to the real numbers defined by f of x equals x cubed is onto. So how do we prove that something is onto? Well, if we follow the definition of onto, what we're saying is that if we take some element in our codomain, then we can show that there exists an element in the domain such that, uh, sorry, such that f applied to that domain element equals our element in the codomain. So what we want to do here is we want to say, let y be some element in our codomain and then talk about why there must be some x in our domain such that f of x equals y. So we'll do that right here. We'll say, let y be an element of the real numbers. What we want to do is we want to note that f of something must equal y. So what we can say is, note that y equals the cube root of y cubed. And the reason why I'm going to say y equals the cube root of y cubed is because then we can note that, well, the cube root of y is 
also a real number. So f applied to the cube root of y equals y. So actually, well, we can do that right here. So we can say that the cube root of y equals uh, cubed equals f of the cube root of y since the cube root of y is a real number. The reason why I can say it's a real number is just because y is a real number. And it's just it just has to do with the way that the cube root works. So we, we're fine just stating that the cube root of y is a real number. We don't have to worry about anything like, oh, well, what if y is negative? You can still take the cube root of a negative number. That's totally fine. So we have that y equals f of the cube root of y. And the cube root of y is a real number. So basically, we're done. We've shown that, well, if we have an element in our codomain, then we can just choose the cube root of that element as our element in the domain that maps to our y in the codomain. So this says that for any, if, if, I, if you give me any element in the codomain, let's say you tell me, okay, well, does negative five have a mapping, ha have a preimage under f? And I can say, yeah, well, the preimage of negative five is the cube root of negative five, and that totally works. If you tell me, uh, what, is, what about the uh, pre-image of 1 million? What if, is, 1 million is in our codomain, because 1 million is a real number. Does that have a pre-image under f? And I say, yeah, that's the cube root of 1 million. That should actually be 1,000? That's, no. Something. I'll, I'll get back to y'all on that one. That'd be 100. The cube root of a million is 100. My bad. So... Anyway, what we have is we've shown, basically we found a pattern for saying, hey, if we have a element in the codomain, then our element, then that has a preimage of the cube root of that element in the codomain. So therefore, uh, f is on two. Uh, I should say by definition. Let's try another one. Uh, here's one where we're going to show that f, uh, let's say, f from the real numbers to the real numbers defined by f of x equals e to the x is not on two. The way we want to do this is we want to show that there exists some element in the codomain that is not possible to be mapped to from the domain. So we'll say, let's find an example of an element in the codomain such that it is impossible for any element in the domain applied, uh, f applied to any element in the domain to be equal to that element in the codomain. And the nice thing about uh, f of x equals e to the x is that e to the power of anything, po uh, uh, sorry, e to the power of any number is actually a positive number. Because if x here is negative, it's just a fractional, um, it's just less than one. If x is zero, it is one. And if x is greater than one, uh, if x is greater than zero, then e to the x is greater than one. So what we can do is we can actually say, well, let's choose zero as an element in our codomain, or let's choose a negative number as an element in our codomain. And we won't be able to get any possible x such that e to the x equals that negative number. And here's the way we'll word that. So let's consider um, consider zero in the real numbers. What we'll do is we'll say, um, note that the natural log of zero is not defined. Because of this, no, uh, I'm sorry, I should say x equals the natural log of zero is not defined. Because of this, no e to the x equals zero is possible. Uh, thus, by definition, Um, let's see, uh, f is not on two. Now let's try out another one. 
um, you know, this completes this proof. This is a direct proof of that. Let's try out a proof by contradiction as an alternate way of approaching this. So suppose for a contradiction that F is on two. Thus, for all uh, Y in the real numbers, there exists some X in the real numbers such that F of X equals E to the X equals Y. Uh, and this is this follows by definition of on two. And then we can simplify this and we can say then for all y there exists an x such that x equals the natural log of y. Now what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to do something similar to up here where I'm going to choose 0 to be our y, but because we're doing a proof by contradiction, I think that this is actually going to, doing a proof by contradiction is going to make this argument a little bit smoother. And here's why. So now what we'll do is we'll consider y equals 0, and note that you know 0 is a real number. The natural log of 0 is not defined. So there is no such x where x equals the natural log of y in this case, since we're saying y equals 0. Now we get to put our contradiction, and we can say that this contradicts our assumption that y is, uh, sorry, that f is on two. Thus, f cannot be on two. And I, th I would say that in this case, the proof of contradiction is a much smoother proof of this theorem than the uh, direct proof way of approaching it. So these both rely on pretty much the same arguments, so, but the proof of contradiction, while it's a little bit longer, it's a little bit easier to understand why, uh, why f is not on two. At least I think it's a little bit easier. Uh, you may find it different, and honestly, both of these are valid ways of going about it. I, in my experience, this happens to be the one that comes a little bit more natural to me. So this one happens to feel a little bit smoother. But, you know, of course, proofs are very much like handwriting. It is up to you to decide what works best and make sure that your uh, argument is logically sound. However, what we can do, so we can notice that the problem with this that made this not on two is that our domain included zero and it included a whole bunch of negative real numbers. So what we can do, sorry, I, I should say our codomain included zero and a whole bunch of negative real numbers. So let's restrict our codomain. Let's say, uh, let's do a theorem. F from the real numbers to the positive real numbers defined by f of x equals e to the x is on two. So once we get rid of zero and once we get rid of all those negative numbers, all of a sudden what I'm saying is that this makes e of x, sorry, e to the x on two as soon as we restrict our codomain to only positive real numbers. And the reason why is because now all of a sudden we're working with this natural log argument, all of a sudden the natural log of y is viable for every y, since y is guaranteed to be a positive real number. So in this case, when our codomain is all positive real numbers, this will make e to, uh, e to the x to the power on two. So the codomain, uh, whether a function is on two and, and or one to one, it can be determined entirely by the codomain. So let's see, um, let's see how we would talk, uh, tackle this proof. So we'll say let, oops, we'll say let y be an element of the positive real numbers. Uh, we would say that uh, note that y equals e to the power of the natural log to the y power. Or sorry, 
e to the power of the natural log of y. And this just comes from uh, some properties of exponents and natural logs that e to the natural log of anything is just equal to that anything in there. So y equals e to the natural log of y. This is totally fine. So y equals e to the natural log of y, which happens to be equal to f of the natural log of y. The reason why this works is because since y is a positive real number, then the natural log of y is defined. So since the natural log of y will then be just a real number, so f of that real number works out. And in this case, f of the natural log of y equals y. So we can say that since uh, y is in the positive real numbers, the natural log of y is a real number. So f is on to, by definition. And the reason why it's important for us to say that the natural log of y is a real number is we're confirming that this is actually an element of our domain. So we're saying since y is a uh, positive real number, the natural log of y not only exists, but is an actual element of our domain. So we've basically found an element of our domain such that f applied to that element equals y. So this completely satisfies the definition of on2. So this is great. We have these two really strong classifications of functions. Each one provides like an extra boundary onto uh, sort of an extra pretty strong condition onto functions. What if we combine those two conditions? What if we have functions that are onto and one to one? Well, as we'll see uh, now, starting now and honestly going into the rest of this quarter, we'll see that the combining the properties of one on uh, onto functions and one to one functions results in an extremely beefy, strong, uh, potentially roided out and dangerous. I don't know, some kind of weird function, but that function has some massive, massive bulging muscles. This got a little bit weird, but you know what? Let's talk about bijections. All right. So we're going to let F be a function from A to B. We'll say that F is called a bijection if f is one to one and f is on two. So what we have some example, what I have here are some examples from functions that we've looked at earlier in this video. Uh, f from the real numbers to the real numbers defined by f of x equals e to the x, bleh, f of x equals e to the x. We can, we say that this is not a bijection because, oh, because not onto. Remember that this is not onto because uh, zero is in our codomain and yet f of zero is not defined. Um, sorry, f of zero is in our codomain, but there's no f of x such that f of x equals zero. Uh, we have f going from the real numbers to the real numbers such that f of x equals x cubed. This is a bijection. We showed that it's one to one and onto f going from the real numbers to the positive real numbers is actually a bijection. So this, uh, we're restricting the domain of this function to be the uh, positive real numbers. This is a bijection. We showed that it's on two earlier and you can basically apply the same, the same logic to sh as uh, we did up in here to show that this function is one to one. So it is a bijection. So really a bijection is a very strong classification of functions for a lot of different reasons. And we'll explore those going into the next few uh, the next few lectures on functions. But bijections are super cool. They're super useful and they have some really fantastic properties. So one of these properties uh, we'll actually go over right now. So I, I explained before that if F is one to one, uh, where, um, Let's say f going from a to b is one to one. What that means is that basically the codomain has to be equal to or less than the size of the codomain. So this means that a has to be less than or equal to, uh, the size of a has to be less than or equal to the size of b. If f going from a to b is on two, what we showed is that the uh, domain has to be equal to or larger than the codomain. So this has to be 
greater than or equal to that. Uh, the size of A is greater than or equal to the size of B. So what this means is that if F going from A to B is a bijection, we know that the size of A is less than or equal to the size of B and the size of A is greater than or equal to the size of B. These both follow from F being one to one and F being on two. And all of this means the only way for both of these to be true at the same time is that the size of A equals the size of B. And we'll actually get into this, um, and not right now, but in the next uh, couple of lectures or so, we'll actually show a proof of why this is true in the lecture about uh, set cardinality. So stay tuned for all of this fun stuff. We'll actually show a really fun proof about why this fact is true, uh, using the idea of drawing uh, cards from decks. So that's what we have coming up. But all we have right now is um, the definition of one-to-one, -one, onto, and bijection. So I really recommend that you familiarize yourselves with these definitions. We'll be using them a lot throughout the rest of the quarter. So make sure you're comfortable with them. If you're not comfortable with them, please ask me as soon as possible. Uh, feel free to watch this video as much as you need to, watch the intro to functions video as much as you need to. But this is definitely another one of the subjects where you want to answer your questions about this as soon as possible, because as we move on, we're really going to be going deep into this type of stuff. So hopefully you feel comfortable with it. And yeah, I will see you all in the next video.